Candy Cane Christmas is a 2020 lifetime movie about finding the holiday spirit even when we have to celebrate a little differently this year. During a time when so many holiday traditions are going to be disrupted, this timely story takes our existential grief and boils it down to one woman's disappointment over her neighbors not decorating their lawn this year. Nothing says privilege like whining about an inflatable snow globe from Target while 10% of your town is on a medical ventilator. Along with its vaguely relevant plot, this movie brings us plenty of other holiday TV movie staples, such as hot cocoa replacing the world's water supply, grown adults talking like magic is real, and a plethora of scenes that serve no purpose other than showing respectful interactions with the elderly. In fact, Candy Cane Christmas might have more slow, pointless story beats than any other Christmas movie I've ever seen, including A Christmas Story, which if you rewatch it, is actually less about Christmas and more about how miserable life was in the 1940s. Today, we're watching a woman named Phoebe embarrass herself and act a fool for Christmas, and still end up with a boyfriend before Boxing Day. Straight people have all the luck. Join me for the year's first holiday-flavored installment of Clip Breakdown, baby jingling. Hello, television viewers. My name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another ho, ho, ho holiday episode of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite TV movies to break them up into little merry festive clips, just little stock and stuff in size clips that I can put in my mouth and let them dissolve over time. Today, we're getting right back to the heart of why I started this channel, which is Hallmark and Lifetime TV movies, specifically the ones that come out during Christmas. These movies give me so much joy and I'm very excited that I picked this little ditty today because we have a lot to talk about. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up so that way I know you wanna see even more clip breakdowns just like this up. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so click that notification bell and you'll always be the first to know when I come cruising down Candy Cane Lane, driving drunk, crashing into kids. Okay, so here's the deal. This movie came out this year. It was probably probably shot in quarantine, although I will give it to the TV Christmas movies this year. They are not letting it show that these were shot under weird circumstances. All of the Christmas movies I've seen so far make no mention of a pandemic, and it shows extras just walking around without masks, so we're clearly trying to live in an escapist reality, which I love. And for the most part, with these productions, you can't tell that anything's different. I will say maybe there's a lot fewer extras in some of the scenes, probably because they couldn't let crowds get too big on set and everyone had to be tested all that. But overall, I think it's actually a benefit to make the stories a little more contained because what would a Lifetime movie be if not for scene after scene of person A talking to person B with twinkling lights in the background? Speaking of twinkling holiday lights, that's exactly where this story starts with young Phoebe, our main character, enjoying Candy Cane Lane as a child. This clip also features another trope from Lifetime TV movies, which is playing a song in the background that has really distracting lyrics. Oh my gosh, any more Yuletide instructions for me to this man singing? Like whose uncle is this with the lyrics going on right now? Cause I feel like he's about to show me a stamp collection. Baking cookies, putting frosting on them. Christmas trees smell like pine. Everybody puts on snow boots cause they don't want their socks getting wet. What in the Feliz Navidad is that? That song needs a lot more seasoning before we can serve it up to the masses. That's what I'm gonna say. Phoebe absolutely loves Candy Cane Lane every year even though I don't really understand what it is. It's like, I guess, the biggest, richest houses in the neighborhood putting up lights and, you know, giving you a little drive-through light experience. Here's Phoebe meeting with her lifelong best friend, Lori. Lori, as a child, seems to be 100% too much to handle. Lori! Did you see the giant gingerbread house? I know. Baby, Mrs. Lori! Have you been to see Santa yet? Not yet. We're going right now! Okay, Lori, you're at Christmas DEF CON 1 right now. We need to bring it down to a three or a four. I've never seen a child so starved for Christmas magic. This girl must only be let out of the house on religious holidays. The best part about Christmas movies on TV is how much every character overreacts to anything Christmas themed. Like you would think that like cheap lights from the Dollar Tree are the most beautiful sight on earth, the way they talk in these movies. I wanna go to Candy Cane Lane every year, forever, no matter what. No matter what. <laughs> 
kids. Say mistletoe. <laughs> Did someone put some schnapps in these kids' hot cocoa? They are being real giggly right now for no reason. Is there a CO2 leak in Santa's village? These girls are tripping. I love Christmas movies because it always feels like there's a director right behind the camera being like, make it more jolly, smile bigger. And that's how you get little bits of these girls just standing there being like, Exorcism on 34th Street, chill out. And that's also how we get these grown adults being like, oh. as soon as someone puts a little plastic angel on top of the street, they'll be like, oh. Like, I like Christmas too, but I don't have a full-on orgasm every time I see some garland lady. Chill. Next, we have a time jump, I don't know, like 30 years into the future, where our girls, Phoebe and Lori, are both running their own flower shop. They're still best friends, somehow. Phoebe decided at a young age that she didn't ever want to go through the trouble of having to find another token black friend, so she's like, Lori, you're getting a job with me. Come on. As you noticed in that last scene, there's like an older woman who runs the whole candy cane lane deal, and the girl girls are like obsessed with her. You would think this is Mother Teresa to the town. I didn't know if it was a teacher of theirs at first, but I don't think so. Maybe. Yeah, I think that's true. Anyway, she's got some bad news for Phoebes. So you're moving to California? What about Candy Cane Lane? There isn't gonna be a Candy Cane Lane this year. The Browns have moved away. Both of the Hunt's children are in college and they just wanna keep it quiet this year. There just aren't enough houses on the street to participate to make it what it was. So we all decided it would be better to just let it go. You can't. Oh yes, I surely can, bitch. You can freeze out here in wherever the hell USA all you want. I'm gonna be vibing on that illegal cannabis in California. Merry Christmas, Vanessa. It was at this point watching the movie that I thought, oh, it seems like they wrote this script in response to like COVID basically, because obviously nobody's doing the same things they would like to do for the holidays this year. Big parties, big festivals, none of that kind of stuff is happening. So I feel like this story is vaguely about like having to accept when things change change. Even though in this story, it's a lot more of a benign reason. Like, oh, it's just changing because people are growing up and their lives are changing and we're getting older. But for me, that kind of just highlights how out of touch Phoebe is. Like you are talking about a thing that you loved as a child, which any adult would look at and think that's not that special. I don't need that to be happy. So to me, the whole time I'm just like, Phoebe, maybe if you had gone to get a little more world experience and this like missing cavalcade of lights is not going to be such a big deal to you. What do I know? Maybe she just has never had any Anyone she knows die before. It's a shame, Phoebe, because some personal tragedy would really give you some much needed flavor. Phoebe, as you can see, is played by Beverly Mitchell, who I used to watch all the time on Seventh Heaven, and she was also in Saw 2. And although Phoebe is happy that this older woman is moving to California to die close to her family, she's still disappointed. I don't know what I'm gonna do if I'm not helping out with Candy Cane Lane. Oh, Phoebe. Oh, Phoebe. Sounds like you're still a virgin in your late 30s, huh? <laughs> Meanwhile, somewhere else in the town, I keep touching this plant. You guys are gonna yell at me. Let me move that out of the way. I'm so sorry. Mwah. Mwah. I made it up to it. Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. That was a Christmas chant for the leave. Okay, so next time on the other side of town somewhere, Eric is our main man of the movie, who I really like in this movie actually, except for his facial expressions and anything that he does with his face. But I mean, he's handsome and he's Lebanese, so I really like that in a man. <laughs> What am I talking about? Just keep moving, Nick. Anyway, he's at the coffee shop and he's getting flirted with by this barista. A barista named Carista. I don't know what her name is. It's a new recipe. Will you try one for me and then tell me if it's any good? Okay. Uh, this one. It's delicious. Really? Yeah, what is that, nutmeg? Oh, and cloves. Tastes like Christmas. <laughs> well, you're in luck, because I've got the same festive blend of herbs and spices currently crammed up my coochie. Taste the Christmas spirit all season long, baby boy. Once Eric gets back to his office, his coworkers are like all about trying to get in on the business of his flirting. Like always, the coworkers are so involved in these movies, I would be like, focus on your own eczema, Johnny. Is that why Coffee Lady keeps giving you discounts? Of course, because she's interested in your loyal patronage. <laughs> that Coffee Lady is like, like, oh, so you're a vet? You must really know your way around an anal thermometer. Oh. Also, it's crazy to me that they even put this coffee lady thing in because we never see that woman again. I think I thought that it was gonna be like an ensemble thing at this point because I was like, oh, this girl's cute. I love her. Her hair smells like coffee all the time. But instead she just never appears again. So cool, really good use of script pages there. I don't see why they wouldn't have had him just go right into the office and then have like, I don't know, someone come to pick up their newborn puppies and they're flirting with him. They're like, 
you really saved my animals. I brought you this tray of Christmas cookies. That would be a more natural way for the coworkers to be like, yeah, she's bringing you those cookies, not just because you saved her puppies. She wants you to cure her kennel cough, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Bacterial infection. So anyway, the whole office is really concerned with Eric's love life because apparently he split with Leslie, his ex, like a year ago nowadays. Phoebe still can't get over the fact that this like little candy cane lane thing is not happening. I'm like, you need to meditate, sweetheart. When something ends, it makes room for something new to begin. Okay, I will give it a shot. I will try to come up with new Christmas traditions. Thanks for your advice, only black friend. You're so wise and peripheral, and you conveniently lack any challenges in your own life to worry about. Freeze you up to meddle with my romance. Love it. This is the first encounter of our two love interests who I call Schmeeble and Deemble, because I don't like their real names, which are Phoebe and Eric. You're up, Schmeeble. Wow. This place is amazing. Yeah, so cool how they made it look like an airport gift shop. What? Also, I feel like the back wall is legit plywood. I don't like this location very much at all. A lot of the times they'll put either the woman in like a high pressure job where she's like, I'm business executive and I don't have time for Christmas. Hang an ornament on my binder and that's good enough for me. Or they'll be like super into Christmas, in which case they're a baker or a florist or a dog groom or something cute and fluffy where they can spend like half an hour a day like talking to a friend. Phoebe falls into the latter group. And she opens up the shop late, right after closing, to make sure Eric gets his gift, which she just knows is for some female in his life. This one. Excellent choice. All right, I'll just check you out. And then I need you to leave immediately because you smile like someone who has a secret knife in their pocket. Also, those flowers literally look like the ones you can get from the grocery store, so good choice. Your dying aunt is gonna really remember those. Throughout this movie, Eric has really forced facial expressions. Again, I feel like there was direction coming from behind the camera being like, smile more, I wanna see your canine. Someone will be like, oh, you just stepped in dog poop. And he'll be like, Wow, you really are knowing everything about Christmas. What? Shut up. Lori, of course, runs out because she can smell that there's man in the room white or right. She's like, I smelled some ball sweat. What's that? Oh, that, just the horse doctor who wants my tits for Christmas dinner, nothing else to look at. That beautiful man with blue eyes and access to ketamine, <laughs> what about it? Of course, Phoebe just assumes that this man has a wife or a girlfriend because he's buying flowers, but we see that that's not exactly what the truth is. He brings them to the old people's home for his aunt. I should say aunt. Do you guys say aunt or aunt? That's what I wanna know in the comments. Let me know that. Oh, P.S., right before I forget about it, we have merch going on here. Ooh, so beautiful for Christmas. Here's the clip. Oh, all you do is work and have dinner with me. You know, I love seeing you. I too. I would really like to see you start a family of your own one day. And I would really like to see you stop handing me letters about the elder abuse that goes on here. I pay extra for that. Phoebe's dad comes into the shop and he's got some comforting words too. He's trying to help her realize that there's more to the Christmas season than just this one event that was like one day out of the whole year. You could organize a toy drive or volunteer for charity. That's a good idea. Well, why don't you help your mother with the cookie baking this year? You tell mother that I'll help her with the cookies when I see an updated version of that will. I love that the dad has to remind his adult daughter that there's more to Christmas than just like hanging up lights outside the rich people's houses. He was like, hey, why don't you divert all of that attention and energy of yours towards these homeless children who need toys, you dumb bitch. Since Phoebe and Eric are both trying to get into new traditions, like Eric is gonna decorate his apartment to look like Christmas, just like his aunt recommended. And Phoebe is trying to make cookies from her grandmother's recipe book, but they're both running into issues, so they have to run to the grocery store. And that's where we get our second meat cute of like 18 meat cutes. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see you there. No, please. Tell Girl, you just dove for that hot chocolate like it was your last embryo. You dove for that like it was the last felt tip eyeliner in all of Canada. What is your deal? I love this shot so much. It's chaotic. Her hand with her manicure goes in so fast that it like the cup can't even handle it. It's like, whoa. Highlight of the whole movie for me, for some reason. The chemical imbalance in my brain is so messed up that that's the funniest thing I've seen in all of 2020. Eric, using his DreamWorks character smile, goes on to make some self-deprecating jokes about how bad he is at Christmas, which again, is not a thing. You're hanging up lights. You can either do it or you don't do it. I guess my decorations have been in the box so long. I'm actually surprised Santa hasn't taken them back. Okay, it's weird when two grown adults are talking about Santa like he's a real person in a private conversation. Like, I'm not here to judge what two consenting adults do, but you straight up think Santa's real and you are a vet. My cat has a kidney stone and you're gonna sprinkle some fairy dust on it. I don't need this in my life. Talking about Santa like he's real is cute when you're talking to a child. When you're flirting up a girl at the grocery store, that's very 
very socially inept for me, sir. These movies just make everything Christmas. Like there's always Christmas music playing in the background. Every scene is loaded with Christmas decorations. Someone could be sitting on their bed and there's garland on the headboard. It's like, why would you put garland on your own bed? Actually, I'm sure a bunch of you decorate your bedrooms for Christmas. Please, if you do, let me know and send me pictures of that in the DMs because that will make me happy. Phoebe continues to confuse herself even though she had a really great conversation with Eric at the grocery store. Are you gonna call him? Of course not. I sold him a plant for his girlfriends. I can't go out to Coco with him. This is just the first of several crazy assumptions that Phoebe makes, which add to the runtime of this movie. And I don't know what they're trying to do here. Like if they're trying to build into her character that she's like untrustworthy or quick to make assumptions, but that's barely built up. They say that she's really stuck in her ways and that's why she loves her regular Christmas traditions every year. But watching her constantly just like assume that this guy has a girlfriend when he never said anything about that is actually more frustrating. It's like not really an assumption that a reasonable person would make. Also because who would buy their romantic partner, those foil wrapped poinsettias for the holidays? Like there's nothing sexy about that. That's a grandma flower, honey. And you as a florist should know that. They try really hard to show Eric in like all of these loving situations with animals. But again, it just comes off really like not realistic to me. He's never doing anything remotely medical looking with these animals. He's just holding them being like, oh, isn't this a good one? Uh, not really. That cat is riddled with cancer. You know, most vets would have told Webster to go to the emergency clinic, but you come racing down here at the crack of dawn? He's my patient. Just curious, as a vet, would it be possible to surgically remove your own hyena smile? Since you like know animals so much, it wouldn't be a problem, right? Coworker Adam continues to try to get Eric to step out of his box more. He's even invited Eric to a party for a restaurant that he invested in. I don't know why Adam's investing in restaurants on the side. It's not clear if he's like a vet tech or what, but he also is a restaurant too. He wants to introduce Eric to some female investor that he thinks he'll like. But I can't get through a single scene with this Adam guy talking. He has no emotion on his face. He's like seriously giving me too cool for school vibes. You're here early. Okay, maybe she didn't, but I could tell that she wanted to. Awesome. What did you talk about? But you didn't get her number. You really are out of practice. Wow, how did they teach that beige filing cabinet to recite lines like that? He's giving me all of the vocal performance of a text-to-speech translator. They wheeled him onto the set and said, Alexa, tell me a Christmas story. Back at Phoebe and Lori's shop, there's another supporting male character named John, I think. He's like their delivery guy. But while he's at the shop, he tells Phoebe that she can help volunteer at the old people's home, sorry, the retirement community that he brings flowers to for their party. And she's like, oh, that's it's a perfect new tradition for me. This is setting up, I don't know, third meet cute for our two main characters. Actually, no, that'll be a fourth because our third one is happening right now. All because Phoebe brings her toy donation box into the vet. Uh, sorry, this this is Phoebe. Well, nice to meet you, Phoebe. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I think actually I owe you a hot cocoa. Why are those coworkers all visibly acting like Helen Keller's tutor when she learned to communicate? They're like, oh, the miracle of life. It like creeps me out when people try to give deep, meaningful looks in real life, okay? Life is not a movie. Don't look at me for emotion. If you ever look at something and it causes you to feel an emotion, I think you're cheesy. Even though Phoebe still thinks that he might have like some other commitment, she agrees to go out for some cocoa for him right there on the spot. And it goes well. They seem to have a good chemistry together, if not a a little awkward. These movies always highlight for me how weird heterosexual dating can be where they like have three full dates before they even kiss. In the gay community, you have to have your entire body splayed and like pinned to a concrete wall before you even know someone's middle name. It's rough out here in Hollywood, okay? Phoebe gets to the retirement community, which is called Monotic Place or something like that. Monotoc Place. Anyway, this is obviously where uh, Eric's aunt lives and Phoebe and Maggie meet for the first time and start to establish a relationship. You're not gonna hang that up yourself are you? Of course I am. Please, let me do that for you. Okay. Excuse me, was that 72 year old woman really gonna climb a two story ladder to put some stars on a tree? I don't see how, what kind of retirement community is this? At the Monotic Retirement Community, we take slip and fall injuries seriously. That's why we promise when she goes down, she's not getting back up. After some good hearted playing around, it's clear that Aunt Maggie is like a real card and Phoebe loves hanging out with her. Some of us are getting together and trying to make our own wreaths. That's so much fun. <laughs> uh, only if you're not all thumbs. Oh, well, I would be happy to swing by and give you some pointers. You do that? 
I'd love to. Wow, so this flower shop that you own, does it just run itself? Also, I love when Phoebe gives that condescending so much fun, like a kindergarten teacher. Oh, so much fun making wreaths, such a cute activity for you little old wrinkly old carpal tunnel ass ladies. Oh. I'd be like, okay, you know what? I think we're done here. Thanks for hanging up our star. But of course she can't go anywhere because who would arrive now but our main man, Eric. What a surprise for meet cute number four, the quattro, the Christmas quattro. <laughs> Wait, wait, this is your aunt? You two know each other. Phoebe owns the flower shop that I got your poinsettia from. The poinsettia was for you. <laughs> yes, isn't he a sweetheart? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. And hopefully this year we can all find out why he sits so weird. I think his spine has been disfigured ever since he found out you could get high off dog heartworm medication. It took exactly 40 minutes in this movie for her to realize this guy was even single because that's how poor they are communicating. In these holiday movies, you, they live in some proprietary world where you cannot tell a person that you're attracted to them. You cannot tell them outright that you want to kiss them. You also cannot sleep together within the first one year of knowing each other. It's very puritanical England, like the main flower just landed, but we have iPhones. One of these movies are gonna be like, I used to love Christmases with my mom before she was hung for being a witch. Although Eric asks her out to dinner, she had already made plans to go to Lori's house for dinner. And when she gets there, she's surprised that it's actually a setup. Hi Phoebe, this is our friend Greg. Greg, this is Phoebe. Hi, it's nice to finally meet you. No, I, I, I must have told you. I remember Greg and Pete played basketball together. I must have forgotten. It's really nice to meet you, Greg. Sorry, I didn't make the connection because no one told me you were going to look pale and hairless like an inflated condom. They bring in this guy, Greg, to kind of just set up how right she and Eric are for each other by kind of showing this incompatible relationship. As you can see, the dinner date is not a huge success. Greg's a cartoonist for the newspaper. Mm -hmm. I love comics. Yeah, actually, I draw political cartoons. They run on the editorial page. I'll take a look next time, although I must admit, I'm more of a funny pages gal myself. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Never thought there was. They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine. She said, listen up, you cartoonist piece of foreskin. If I like reading the funny pages, you ain't gonna say nothing about it. I'm gonna be reading Garfield when I'm giving birth to our first child just to piss you off. Don't even test me. Lori is like, okay, Phoebe, can I grab your muzzle from the guest room? But weirdly, after the date, Greg kind of asks for a second chance. He's like, I probably came on too strong. And she's like, you did, by saying that I was allowed to read what I like. So she agrees to go out on one more dinner to this restaurant investment party that he's a part of. Get it? We're gonna have meet cute number five, the Christmas Cinco, baby. Five golden rings, four calling birds, three turtlenecks, everybody dies, then we're singing about all our songs. For their next date, Greg shows up in a tan turtleneck in order to visually remind us what his penis looks like. Lori said you really like the holidays. Favorite time of the year. Do you ever, you know, sometimes feel like Christmas is kind of like been there, done that? say something negative about Christmas, the holiday that makes up 95% of my personality, I'm gonna smash this hors d'oeuvre tray over your face, you bald bastard. How dare you? Don't you think Christmas has kind of been here, done that? Like, you know, we've seen stockings, we've done candy canes before. I think it has more to do with people's like Messiah being born. So it's probably gonna be in fashion for a while. I don't think that like Passover is still a thing just because people really love grape juice. Obviously this is really turning off Phoebe who's like, wow, if you don't like Christmas, you might as well be a neutered friggin' marshmallow boy standing here in front of me like a fat baby just on the ground dying. That's what I think of you. A fat drooling baby boy with no penis. And he's like, cool, so I'll get you another drink. But that's when Eric comes in and really turns this ship around. Just follow me, we're just over here. Eric! If you slow down this footage, you can actually see Phoebe slam the abort button on her date like the end of American Ninja Warrior. She walks right up to Eric and is like, hi there, we're gonna go have sex in your car now. But that's not really what happens. They're just like, oh, hi, um, okay. But they're obviously both with other people, so they build into their crazy assumptions that they're dating other people. Even though in their last conversation, they literally kind of figured out that they're both interested in one another. Like, I just wish that they could have like a real conversation and stop trying to like figure stuff out like teenagers investigating each other through Facebook. I don't think she's as interested in me as I am in her. I saw her last night at the party. She was with another guy. From her perspective, weren't you there with another woman? 
Yeah, I, I guess it could have looked like that. No, it definitely looked like that, you hairpiece. I don't get the double standard where it's like he can be there with just a female acquaintance, but if she's with a man, then she must be accounted for by that man. How come he's allowed to have a female friend, but she's not allowed to have a friend of the opposite sex? I can't tell if that's dumb, sexist, or just regular heterosexual nonsense. Can you please let me know in the comments? But on the flip side, of course, Phoebe has the same exact assumption. She's like, well, the thing is, he was with some blonde woman who looked Russian, so what am I gonna do? Learn gymnastics all of a sudden? So she's kind of bummed again, and that brings us right back to our main point of plot. It doesn't feel like Christmas. Because of Candy Cane Lane? Oh yeah, remember that? Candy Cane Lane, the thing this whole movie is named after? Kind of feels like that should be a more strong plot driver at this point when we're 20 minutes from the end, but okay. I think it's kind of like got me a step outside this movie because Phoebe is really passive about the main conflict, which is that Candy Cane Lane is not happening and her like identity, her Christmas identity is in crisis. And then she has absolutely no motivation throughout the whole thing. Like people have to tell her what to do. Her dad has to be like, why don't you donate toys to charity? Why don't you go go on a date and get that ice pussy melted. She has basically nothing going on in her own life to drive her to these things. Like, why couldn't it be like every year, not only was Candy Cane Lane like this magical experience, but it also raised money that helped feed the foster children for the whole year because they collected cans and donations. And that meant that with Candy Cane Lane not being able to happen, there was gonna be this shortage and the foster community was gonna close down, something scary like that. Then she would also be like really focused on trying to help help make this Christmas as good as she could for kids. Everyone would be like either helping her or trying to dissuade her or tell her to relax. And she's like, I can't relax. I have to save Christmas for these kids. I want everyone to have these amazing memories of Candy Cane Lane like I did when I was a child. That way the conflict would actually be about trying to raise the money for the orphanage and not just about finding something to keep busy with when the decorations aren't happening. What do you guys think would be a better plot in the, in the comments? I would like to know. In this scene, Eric is dressed like he just got out of a pack Son. I don't know what his costumes are for this. He's supposed to be like a vet, but he dresses like a nicely dressed 18 year old boy. Meanwhile, like Maggie is playing jigsaw with people's romantic lives this Christmas because she's all up in this DIY wreath making party. We are all getting together tomorrow to try to make Christmas wreaths. You ladies are doing some DIY, okay. Well, Rhoda saw this article on the website. She said it doesn't look hard. That's so classic Rhoda. <laughs> yeah, classic Rhoda always reads things on websites. Like, what are you even talking about, Eric? What part of that is classic Rhoda? Wanting to make wreaths? Uh, you know that that's easy. Wreaths are not complicated. To decorate a wreath is something a child could do. They act like this is starting some sort of nuclear reactor. And then watching, ooh, <laughs> Christmas time. My Christmas gift to you was that dainty noise that I just made when that fell over. Ooh, auto-tune that and make it a Christmas melody. Ooh, 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 ooh. After seeing some of these ladies try to make wreaths themselves, you would think that they all have like compromised brain firmness. I, I can't seem to get the ornament to stay on. Well, you just uh, put a dab of glue um, and then just hold it in place and make sure it dries completely. Oh. Perfect, there you go. Lady, you did not just ask how to use glue. I think Rhoda might need to visit our memory care specialist here at the facilities. 80 year old woman never used glue before. Like, I'm pretty sure that was a kindergarten thing. And then Eric joins and he has to get a, like a private lesson on how to make wreaths because he's late. Again, it's something you could look at and figure out how to do. So what's the tea? But we start with the wire to secure. Wrap it around. You can just um, add that to it. Uh, what are these for? Uh, just wrap it in. Where? <laughs> Wherever you'd like. I. I think I did it wrong. I am prepared to burn these white devils at the stake. Has no one seen a wreath before in their lives? Have you ever been to a home goods? Ever been to a Christmas tree shop? Like, come on. Christmas movies like this love to make like man seem really inept at decorating things or getting what Christmas is all about. Like they'll look at a Christmas tree and be like, oh what, it has ornaments on it, right? And then the woman has to be like, you dumb, dumb ass. You can't just put ornaments on a tree. You've got to space them out perfectly and put the tinsel just so, so that it glimmers in the moonlight. And then the man can be like, you really know a lot about Christmas, don't you? And then the woman can be like, well, it's just been my favorite holiday since I was a kid when my mom killed herself on my birthday. You know, it's always that thing. Why can't it ever be like neither of us have any time to do these stupid crafts because we're grown adults and we have jobs. That would speak to my Christmas experience a little bit more. They keep having to work out their relationship statuses with one another because apparently they don't know how to check each other's social media. Your date. He was an investor too, right? Oh, no, 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 that. That was not a date. Not like you and Haley. You two seem cute together. I, I barely know her. Adam 
set us up. <laughs> I thought that... <laughs> Me too. This movie would be 20 minutes long if you two would just communicate like adults. Are you single? Because I want your Christmas in my holly jolly retirement home wreath, okay? That's all she needs to say and we would have it cracking by New Year's Day. You know what I'm saying? Like we wouldn't even have to worry about all this TikToking. The flirtation continues to be strong. Now that they both are finally on the same page about their relationships for like 10 minutes in this movie, it's like we can finally have some peace. I think we'll manage. <laughs> Okay, Aunt Maggie, remember we talked about smiling with your mouth closed from now on? It's like the interior of a whale carcass in there. I forget when, but at some point, Eric mentions that he's been taken care of by his aunt his whole life because his parents have been dead since he was a child. They died in a car accident when he was a kid. So they're kind of touching base on their mm, feelings about Christmas and how it's kind of complicated this year. Candy Cane Lane. That sounds perfect. It's gone. Oh no, growing up, it was just my Aunt Maggie and I, and I never got to really experience Christmas with a big family. He just said, oh, sorry about your Christmas parade. Did I mention that my parents exploded in a Buick? Shut your blonde mouth up about Christmas sadness. Also, Eric kind of plays like a little practical joke here, which is a little out of character for him. Like he tells her, oh, there's some leftovers over there. And it's a trick to get her to stand under mistletoe. I just didn't see him doing anything like this before in the movie, like playful or flirtatious like this, but whatever. A little inconsistent for the character for me, but that's the least of our worries. I found this earlier. I wanted to stand under it if you wanted to, you know, stand under it with me too. Coffee's ready? Yeah. I'm sorry, did you just coerce my body to be under your mistletoe? Also, why are the ladies in these TV Christmas movies so colonial New England about kissing? They're like, no, no, no. I could never touch the lips of a man that I haven't met with my priest before. I would like to see just one Hallmark or Lifetime Christmas movie with a realistic portrayal of the beginning of a relationship. Because as it is, these movies, like the timeline always feels so unrelatable. Like they meet the love interest and then a week later, they're at the big Christmas party where they kiss for the first time and basically commit to being together for the rest of their lives. Like one of them always is like, I gave up the big job or I'm staying here and I'm not moving back to the city. All before you even know this person's circumcision status could never be me. After hearing about Candy Cane Lane, Eric wants to know more about what this past activity was like. That's incredible. Must be nice to get so much joy out of browsing the customer review photos on Lowe's.com. Nothing about those pictures make it look entirely special. Like, I don't know, maybe it's cause we're missing all of the extras. This doesn't look like a Christmas festival. It just looks like a country road that they like decorated. I get why a kid would be excited to drive through a tunnel um, of lights for sure. But no adult would look at that and be like, that's incredible. How did they even do it? Command strips? Eric's up to something. So he calls that delivery guy, John, uh, over for one of the most pointless scenes I've ever seen in any movie. Yeah. Hi, he must be Joe. Yeah, is Eric here? Yeah, he'll be out in a sec. Joe. Hey. Hi, thanks for coming on such short notice. I was wondering if you'd be up for one last job before Christmas. Sure. Did this really need a whole scene? Like a 90 minute movie, we spent three minutes on this guy coming in, petting a stranger's dog, talking to the crunchy, crispy, curly hair woman, and then having this guy be like, can I hire you to do a job? And him saying yes. Like all of that could have been a phone call. <laughs> what? A couple things usually are the reason for like a pointless scene like this, for making it into a movie. Perhaps this scene contained more story elements at some other earlier draft of the script. And once those got removed, it felt a little thin. Maybe they just had the dogs on set and they were like, we need to show these dogs some more. They just needed to pad out this movie to make it 90 minutes long. But there's a million more interesting ways to do that. For example, we haven't really seen much about Eric's like life as an orphan. Why can't we get some backstory into what it was like for him growing up? Or maybe he visits his old orphanage and realizes that they're not doing well and that inspires him to take this next step. Or we could sorely use some more character development from Phoebe. All we know is that she's really stuck in her ways. We have no way of knowing why that is. Also, we've never seen her mother Mother, except for that first scene up until this point. We see her again at the end. So I feel like this would be a good point to give that cookie baking scene with mom where we can learn a little bit more about Phoebe's childhood. Don't give me this dog petting nonsense. All we're missing is the holly. I can check with my supplier, see if we can get a good deal because it's near the end of the season. Great. You said that you drove deliveries from multiple florist shops. So I don't know why you would have a holly supplier. Your truck is not a florist shop, is it? They don't even bother to give John a fully fleshed out job. Eric is out to dinner on their first real date with Phoebe. 
Phoebe. They're at this restaurant that everyone's investing in, which again, is just like a really noisy, because they talk about it, they're like, this place seems to be doing great. And I got confused, I was like, wait, is Eric investing in the restaurant? No, the coworker Adam is. And then is her date, her date was investing in the restaurant, but then Eric's date, the blonde woman, was also investing in the restaurant. So there's like five investors, none of them are main characters. Why are we even talking about it? This movie has time for everything, but no like actual Christmas. We're learning about the business of starting a restaurant. You could do something extra for the foster kids. A little party, nothing big. My aunt said that Manatic Place would be willing to host and we could have the kids over there, open their presents, some hot cocoa, cookies. That's an amazing idea. The kids are really gonna love it. Ooh, maybe after, then you and the kids can put on like a Christmas play about what it's like to have dead parents. No, that's too much, it's too ambitious. So we're off on our way to having the magical foster kid party that everyone wants to go to. And Eric is really getting into the Christmas spirit. <laughs> They said, yes, you can shoot in our store, but only in the toilet paper aisle where it's already picked clean by panic shoppers. Did you guys notice that post-production blur they had to put on the wall of laundry detergent? Cause the branding would all be really prominent. All right guys, I'm sorry to let you know, but it's time for our third act conflict. And it's a classic misunderstanding of overheard information. I have a feeling that this has always been like a classic film trope. Cause like, you know, like dramatic irony is a thing, but I feel like this particular overhearing the wrong part of a conversation has been a part of Christmas movies ever since White Christmas, where they misheard about them using that resort for the big Christmas show and then bailing. Phoebe is on her way to pick up those toy donations from the vet office when she hears Adam running his dumb boy mouth. I can't believe Leslie called this morning though. After all this time, just out of the blue like this, knowing that Eric had such a hard time getting over. I'm just so glad that everything's working out. It's like Christmas magic. It's Christmas magic that your boss is remaining divorced from his ex-wife? You guys have a weird standard for what magic is. What Phoebe failed to hear was the part about Eric immediately hanging up the phone after the ex-wife called and being so into Phoebe. So she's all upset and is like, well, I'm not going to this Christmas party because me and Eric are not on the same page. I thought he was gonna be having missionary sex with me this winter. I'm not going. <sighs> I overheard that Eric is back together with his ex-girlfriend, so it's... What? Wait, wait, well, wait, how do you... I just really want to be alone right now. Do you forget the three other times that your stupid ass assumed something wrong about this because you didn't get the full story? Now you're believing something that you heard around the corner at a vet's office where there were dogs barking in your ears and cats pissing on your feet? I don't like it. I don't like your attitude, Missy. You don't want a boyfriend. If this is your attitude, you're afraid to fall in love and you need to see a therapist. By the way, me telling people they need to see therapists is like, an, is something that I need to see a therapist about. Now we have another really confusing, pointless scene where the characters don't seem to remember what they were doing just now. Like in the scene previous, they got information and then they enter a new scene acting like fresh slate. Oh. <laughs> Fresh slate indeed, my flat hair. I'm wearing a hat because I'm about to go get a haircut. So I didn't want to have shaggy hair, but now I look like I have a bald cap on. Anyway, I'm talking too much again. This is where Eric finds out that Phoebe is not coming to his little magical shindig. Phoebe isn't coming. Why not? Is she okay? I don't know. What could have happened? I, I just saw her. She looked kind of upset at the clinic earlier. She must have heard us and thought you were back with Leslie. Yeah, Lori already knew this because that's what Phoebe told her two minutes ago. So I don't know why Lori's standing here being like, I don't know what's up. Couldn't she be like, did something happen where she thinks you're back with your ex? Cause that's what she told me. Like, wouldn't that have been more realistic and more fun to watch? Cause I wouldn't be sitting here like, why aren't you talking Lori? Open your stupid mouth. But I guess when you serve up your third act conflict, 10 minutes before the end of the movie, you have no choice but to wrap it up really quick in three successive scenes. Said how great it was that you and Leslie were working out. About you and I working out. You never told me about Leslie. <laughs> You could have told me. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, totally fair. When did you want me to tell you? At the grocery store, in front of my aunt, or last night at my first ever meal with you? Like, I feel like I didn't have to bring it up yet. I was never married to this woman. It's someone I broke up with a year ago. Like Phoebe, get a grip on your Christmas ornaments. You're acting nuts. You'll never find me acting yuletide foolish about a man when I haven't even seen his house yet. And yes, that is a euphemism. Finally, things are cleared up and Eric takes Phoebe to the orphan party. That's not what they call it. <laughs> It's a weird name for it. The foster kid party, it's a little better. Phoebe is super surprised to see that Eric has basically recreated Candy Cane Lane for her. And she's noticing all the right details. <laughs> oh, cotton candy. 100% me, me to the max. I would pull up a chair and be like, you better scatter you homeless children. This is my booth. Eric gets a little fun in at Adam whose nosiness has, I don't know, kind of like, I hate, I'm just ready for this to be over at this point. I'm like, okay, we got what we needed. Fire! No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 
Merry Christmas. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, why did the whole town just overreact to those snowballs? They're acting like he just got shot with a rubber bullet. There are so many of those flabbergasted, open mouth expression moments. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would spell it O-A-H, cause they're like, oh, 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 I'm so sorry, oh, oh. That's not a sound we make all the time in real life. Pull it back, Patricia. Now we see the mom for the first time since that first scene, proving that she's not dead, which is what I assumed when I first watched this. Oh look, they have hot cocoa. Go get some. Okay, see you soon. One would think that you idiots need hot cocoa to live. Like, is your blood plasma made of Swiss Miss, honey? What is the deal? Is there powdered milk in your nose? Hot cocoa is good, but I mean, like, it's not the best thing on earth, especially when you're out at a parade or whatever and they're selling you a $1 cup of hot cocoa. That's never the best kind. It's like the, it's like mixed with water. Eric comes back and he has one more Christmas gift for Junior. <laughs> I don't know why I called her that. Does this guy think mistletoe is legally required to kiss somebody? I think you're thinking of consent. Anyway, what do you guys think of Candy Cane Christmas? I love getting back into the Christmas spirit and I love seeing what's her name from Seventh Heaven all over my screen with her little haircut. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Tell me what Christmas movies I should watch next. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns like this. I'll leave a link to the whole playlist below. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first on my sleigh ride every day. Um, also check out my merch if you're interested. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for sucking on that candy cane with me today. I will see you next time. Uh.